Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is David Miliband. I'm the president and CEO of the International Rescue Committee, which is a global humanitarian charity. Just before you go, Tony, don't go. I'm about to say something nice about you, so don't go. You've got to stay for this bit. Um, uh, we are a global humanitarian charity, and we run refugee resettlement uh, in the United States in 29 U.S. cities. And Tony, I just want to say thank you for the leadership that you've shown in your time as Deputy Secretary and also in your previous roles. I, I know from your family background that you are brought up with the right values, and you're turning those values into practical action. And I really, on behalf of the IRC, want to thank you for that. Um, the good news for the audience is that I'm supposed to meet the Prime Minister of Pakistan in 23 minutes, 16 blocks away. So Tony was both the appetizer and the main course, and I will be a short espresso before your, uh, before, before your uh, panel discussion um, commences. Um, 10 years ago, certainly 20 years ago, we wouldn't be having this meeting because the iconic image of a refugee, someone in a refugee camp, dominated policy debate. Today, 59% of refugees are in cities. Cities are in the front line. The mayor of Athens I've had the privilege of working uh, with. And so the agenda has changed. And the agenda is about economics as well as social service. It's about markets as well as government. It's about long-term sustainable solutions and contributions to the places that refugees go, not just what they get until they go home. And there has been no more visionary advocate of that than uh, my friend Antonio Guterres. I had, got, had the good fortune to get to know him when he was the Prime Minister of Portugal, where he did an extraordinary job. And his leadership of the UNHCR, which I had the benefit to see the latter part of when I joined the IRC, was really stellar. And the fact that you are still carrying the torch for the humanity and for the progress that you've stood for in those two previous roles, I think, is really marvellous. Um, my, my, my point today is, is twofold. First of all, that this week was significant because both ends of the refugee crisis, what's happening at source in the fragile states to which people are fleeing, and what's happening in refugee resettlement, both ends of the challenge are being addressed. And secondly, people have not been afraid to talk about the politics as well as the policy agenda. That's why this week has been significant. We've not solved the problem. We've got a massive challenge ahead, but I just want to reflect on those two points very briefly. First of all, both ends of this. Let's not forget that the reason people in Kenya or in Lebanon or in Afghanistan are furious about conferences on the quote-unquote European refugee crisis is that they believe they've had a refugee crisis for 10, 20, 30, 40 years, and no one's paid any attention to it. And they believe that it was only when tragic scenes on the shores of Europe got the media's attention that the world started paying attention to the refugee crisis. And they've got a very good point. 86% of the world's refugees are in poor countries, not in rich countries. My, uh, I live in New York now, but my country, the UK, is convulsed by this debate about 9,000 people in Calais, as if that is the greatest part of the refugee crisis. It's not. And so I believe that the discussions you're having today are important not just for Athens or Barcelona or Stuttgart or Hamburg. They're important for Nairobi. They're important for Islamabad. They're important for Addis Ababa. They're important for Istanbul. And we've got to see all sides of it. Striking to me is that the humanitarian airplane has for a very long time had one wing, a social services wing. I think we can now say that the economics of humanitarian intervention are beginning to be addressed in a serious way. The World Bank's concessional financing facility is big news. The entry of the World Bank rewriting its mandate so that fragile states that are not poor can nonetheless receive World Bank assistance is a big deal. <coughs> Tariff-free access for Jordanian products into European markets is a big deal. The beginnings of a private sector rally that Tony Blinken talked about on this issue is a big deal. The challenge is now to exploit it. Just to give you one example, labor supply amongst refu from refugees is a really tough issue. We know this in Jordan. There are cultural issues. There are legal issues. There is real fears of re amongst refugees of taking uh, jobs. And this is in the cities. Not, we're not talking about camp-based systems. So I, I believe that we're beginning to get a balance, at least in the policy debate, about the economics as well as the um, social uh, interventions. And I just want to give a shout out to the importance of cash delivery, either in, um, not literally wads of cash, but um, financial support for refugees, because the most proven way of helping refugees and helping communities is to distribute cash. 
We, we did a study in Lebanon, $1 given to a refugee, $2.16 locates and rotates in the local economy. The mayor of Athens has been a real proponent uh, of this, and I think it's a, it's a really important point. So point one, we're beginning to, I think, have the kind of debate we need about what's happening upstream. Let me just talk about the refugee resettlement uh, side of this, because in 29 US cities for 60 years, the IRC has been resettling refugees. Uh, and there may well be lessons for Europe uh, in this. Um, number one, there's no choice between values and security. There's proper vetting. And those of us in the humanitarian system shouldn't be ashamed of that. We shouldn't be afraid of it. We shouldn't decry it. We should call for it to be more efficient and take less than 12 to 18 months to uh, do the vetting. But we should be perfectly um, proud of it. <laughs> Uh, secondly, jobs. It's interesting to me as a European that in our continent, the assumption is you need training before you can get a job. The American assumption is you get a job, you get the training, you get the social integration. I'm absolutely convinced from the experience I've seen in uh, the US that Europe needs to understand this. If we put people in training pens for a six month, nine month, a year before they're going to get a job, it's not going to happen. Uh, the labor market uh, is going to expand or needs to expand and it needs to embrace uh, the opportunities of these people. The voluntary partnership that Tony Blinken uh, talked about, mosques, synagogues, churches, secular organizations like uh, my own. I, Europe has a rich civil society as well as a stronger state in some ways than the US. Uh, that is an advantage. Education, uh, one of the priorities that we have is to get kids into school and give them the extra help they need. And when the Norwegian foreign minister said at the UN yesterday, that um, he met a family from Aleppo who said, look, we can survive the bombing, but we can't survive the fact that our kids can't go to school. You see some of the motivation uh, that exists, and I think the educational side of this is key. I want to raise one final point on the refugee resettlement experience that is really tough for a European audience, and that is about citizenship. In the US, after five years as a refugee, assuming you're appropriately behaved, you've got the right to apply for citizenship. And that's a really tough issue in Europe. After a year in the US, you can uh, apply for a green card. But in our experience, that path to citizenship is a really important binding item in the successful integration of refugees into American life. Uh, so we've got a debate about how to improve and reform and expand the humanitarian system upstream. We've got a commit set of commitments on refugee resettlement. And I think that the challenge now is to implement. First point. Second point, I want to say a word about politics as well as policy. And I want to uh, advise you to look at the two pictures on the wall behind me. It's significant that we're meeting here. I mean, this family who we honor in this house have a remarkable ability to inspire people of my generation and my politics, frankly. And you read behind you. In the future days, which we seek to make secure, we look forward to a world founded on four essential freedoms. Still makes the hair stand up on the back of your neck. But I want you to think about this really hard, because the mayor and other politicians here are struggling with this. In 1941, Albert Einstein wrote to the lady over there. And he wrote to her, and he said, I beg you, I beseech you to persuade your husband, the president, to allow Jews from Europe to come to America. There is a slaughter coming, and we need to allow people to come here. And even this politician wasn't able to open the gates of the United States. It wasn't until 1944 that the US started admitting Jews in any significant number to the US. So the politics, as well as the policy here, are really tough. And maybe if I had the answer to the politics, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now. <laughs> so it's not for me to pretend that I've got an easy answer to the politics. But I think it's important to recognize it. I think it's important to not to underestimate, point one, the vital importance of speaking up for why refugee resettlement, to take that as an example, why diverse societies are a matter for the head as well as the heart. And the words that have been used by various leaders today, this week, matter. If you're not willing to stand up for the kind of society that you believe in, then it will die. Second point, it's imperative not to demean or brush off uh, the 
fears and the concerns of those who have concerns. Uh, just because some of the opponents of refugee resettlement demean refugees doesn't mean that those of us who support refugee resettlement should demean those who are concerned about it. And the lesson for me of the Brexit vote is that we're living in a time when there is a danger that identity politics and inequality politics can come together through the prism of or the debate about immigration in quite dangerous ways. And we should acknowledge that and be uh, aware of it. And the mayor and others around Europe are facing not just conventional political threats, but unconventional ultra-right political threats. And we need to understand that. And part of the job is to, un is to address people's concerns and to address them, not just rhetorically, but substantively. Those people who are concerned about the inequalities driven by globalization are making an important point. And the bottom end of the labor market does need to be uh, supported. Third point that's critical in my view, without fair shares, no city and no town and no country will believe that it should continue to bear its burden. And this is a massive issue in Europe at the moment. The relocation scheme from Greece has relocated less than 6,000 people. There are still 45,000 people stuck in Greece. Some of them we're serving, 20% of them get water and sanitation from us. Some of the conditions they're facing are dreadful. And there's got to be a fair distribution, and that's why the US number is good, the rise to 110,000, 25,000 Syrians, but it's not, let, let's not think that we've, we're done, thank you very much, American government, that's the end of it. The pressure needs to keep up on the US to match the kind of um, standards that Canada and other countries have uh, set, and we need to do the same kind of uh, job in Europe as well. Um, I really am gonna be interested in how your discussions conclude. I hate coming along to meetings, speaking and then leaving, especially when I don't take questions, but I hope you'll take my apology in good faith and let me sort of dash out and give my excuses if I'm late for my next meeting. Thank you very much indeed.